I'm Pastor Brian Paulson, and this is The Message. Thank you for listening here in Libertyville, in Lake County, or all around the world. Center your heart now with the prayer for illumination, listen deeply to Holy Scripture, and get ready for God to deliver a word to you through the message by our associate pastor, the Reverend Amy Heinrich. Please join your hearts with mine in our prayer for illumination. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Our first scripture reading today is uh, what we already uh, recited in the call to worship it is from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Listen for God's word again. Many nations will go and say, Come, let's go up to the Lord's mountain, to the house of Jacob's God, so that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in God's paths. Instructions will come from Zion, the Lord's word from Jerusalem. God will judge between the nations and settle disputes of mighty nations. Then they will beat their swords into iron plows and their spears into pruning tools. Nation will not take up sword against nation. They will no longer learn how to make war. Come, house of Jacob, let's walk by the Lord's light. The second scripture reading for today will be found in the Gospel of John. And I will be reading selected verses from chapter 14. I will ask the Father, and he will send another companion who will be with you forever. This companion is the spirit of truth, whom the world can't receive because it neither sees him nor recognizes him. You know him because he lives with you and will be with you. The companion, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I told you. Peace I live with you, peace I give with you. I give to you not as the world gives, don't be troubled or afraid. The word of the Lord, amen. Our Follow Me focus for this week challenges us to reflect deeply on what it takes to cultivate inward and outward peace in our lives and the world. This is precisely what I have been mulling over and over again as my husband Rob and I just visited Berlin and Dresden. I knew these two German cities would carry haunting gravitas from World War II, and they did. While we were there, I kept encountering the ghosts of the past, asking serious questions about how such an unspeakable atrocity could happen with the genocide of six million Jews, along with gypsies and homosexuals? What are the continual reverberations and trauma from such a war? How can we humans who have such a penchant for violence strengthen our spiritual and moral consciousness and our capabilities for nonviolent resolution of conflict? How can we develop the healing powers of empathy, forgiveness, and love cultivated through prayer. I invite you on a meditative montage, a contemplative journey of vignettes through my trip in dialogue with scriptural and theological reflection. Rob and I were blessed to have a nine-hour personal tour of Berlin, led by Gabe Fawcett, a brilliant Oxford-educated historian. He took us to the Brandenburg Gate, the former wall, the place where Hitler's bunker was, the Holocaust Memorial, the Jewish Museum, and more. I will never forget his startling and perplexing words to me. As I was seeing school church children rehearsing the horrible history of World War II, as I was understanding that the whole country has days of remembrance such as Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, the pogrom against Jews by the Nazis in November of 1938, I affirmed to Gabe what a seemingly good job the Germans were doing with the reckoning of their past, 
taking responsibility for it, learning from it so as not to repeat it. Gabe said to me, Amy, you're right, they are doing this and they know it's the right thing. However, I'm not sure they're going about it in the right way. It can be a public display of political correctness without a conversion of the heart. They aren't coming out the other side with a sense of redemption, peace, joy, and resurrection hope. Only national guilt. He said from his perspective, many of them are lacking the spiritual resources for that transformation because communism in Eastern Ger Germany destroyed so many churches, leaving many as self-avowed atheists. Wow, challenging words. Ever since he spoke them, they have stuck to my soul. I thought about our own country struggling with our own reckoning with our past sins, such as systemic racism, and how we too must have a deeper narrative to help us come out the other side whole and not just scarred. And the good news is, we do. It is the very story and heartbeat of Christianity that calls us to confront and confess our personal and collective sins, but not to stop there with guilt, cynicism, and despair, but with redemptive hope. We allow the waters of grace to wash over us and bless us with the rivers of forgiveness, to be anointed with a peace that only God can give. And then God calls us to a fresh new beginning of sharing that peace with the world and doing the hard work of truth and reconciliation. We rehearse this spiritual practice of metanoia every Sunday with confession, forgiveness, and the passing of the peace. It is God's gift to us and it saves our hearts from becoming hardened by the violence in the world. As we journey with resurrection hope, we are called to a conversion of heart that often begins with lament. I think of Jesus, who looked over Jerusalem and wept with lament and said, if you had only known what made for peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing, but you were not willing. How our God must look over our world and cry in lament, saying to us, if you had only recognized the things that make for peace, let us be willing to accept Christ's invitation to be gathered at his breast as his beloved children, held close under his wing, that we may be loved into a change of heart and learn the things that make for God's shalom, which is far more than the end of war. It is the presence of full societal and personal well-being, justice and righteousness. We humans tragically are so skilled and studied in the ways of warfare and are sorely lacking in the ways of peace, diplomacy, and nonviolent resolution of conflict. In Dresden, Rob and I went to the Military History of Germany Museum, partly designed by the Jewish architect Daniel Liebeskind the very one who designed our 9-11 Ground Zero Museum. We spent four hours walking through war history from the 1300s to present. It made an indelible impact. It helped us become aware about how one war sets the pretext for the next and the next. Our history is literally shot through, pun intended, with more war than peace. The costs of war are inestimable. One thing I really loved about the museum is it didn't glorify war, but stood back at a critical distance asking weighty moral questions. 
One section in the museum dealt with the almost unspeakable suffering brought on by war. Listen to these words from the museum. People are killed or suffer physical and psychological injuries when wars are fought, leaving deep wounds. Soldiers as well as civilians are affected, no matter whether they play an active part or are passively enduring it. The end of war does not mean the end of suffering. All post-war societies must face the consequences of war for example, the integration of the war wounded, and the question of guilt and responsibility. Another section of the museum was dedicated to war and memory. Listen to these words. Wars are etched on the memories of people. Concepts of war range from glorification and mystification to the wish to abolish war altogether to make a way for perpetual peace. Perceptions of war are determined by economic interests, religious beliefs or ideologies, traditions and rituals, art and mass media. Schools, universities and museums provide instruction in military history. For a long time, war myths were used to justify claims to privilege and property as well as new wars. These myths fueled prejudices, hatred, and the desire for revenge. The attitude towards war is changing. In today's Europe, many memorials warn against war and commemorate their victims. Some monuments of victorious battles are left to decay and fall into oblivion. I left the museum full of questions about the history of war, and how important the memory narrative is and from whose perspective. I was overwhelmed by the magnitude of suffering caused by war. I felt heartsick over humanity's predilection for violence, protecting power and wealth. All of this felt intensified with the backdrop of Putin's obscene war in Ukraine and the costly consequences felt globally. I left with the dream of peace studies being taught as core curriculum in every school and university in the land, that we may become skilled ambassadors of reconciliation. I remember the training I got to be such a peacemaker from the Fellowship of Peace and Reconciliation that spiritually empowered us peacemakers to confront the Ku Klux Klan with nonviolence. And it worked. I left fervently praying for our capacity to morally evolve and learn how to coexist, lest we literally destroy ourselves. I left embracing God's dream expressed by the prophet Isaiah, Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord that God may teach us God's ways and that we may walk in God's paths. God will judge between the nations and arbitrate between the peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war anymore. May it be so. Another Daniel Liebeskin Museum we went to in Berlin was the Jewish Museum. He has a brilliant yet disturbing way of forcing you to feel things viscerally through his architecture. One of the rooms in the museum was like a cell, completely dark with only a sliver of light to the outside world at the unreachable top of a very high wall. This is what it must have felt like to be in a concentration camp, surrounded by dehumanizing darkness with the light seeming unattainable. As I stood there, the epiphany of Viktor Frankl during three hellish years in a concentration camp came to mind. 
Frankel realized that that sliver of light was within him and that the Gestapo could not extinguish it. In his life-changing book, Man's Search for Meaning, he described the inner light as the last of the human freedoms, the ability to choose your attitude toward the circumstances you find yourself in, which are often out of your control and so difficult to bear. Viktor Frankl discovered that suffering can be redemptive if we don't return evil for evil, violence for violence, but choose another way. Choose to rise up above it all and embrace the most powerful light within us, the light of love. Jesus says to us in the Gospel of John, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you everything and remind you all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. The Holy Spirit that dwells within us is that inextinguishable light of love and it is more powerful than any war. This seemingly small flicker of light within us, even in the darkest times, is the secret to finding inner peace and hope, and it is the secret to summoning the courage to be a peacemaker. May we, like Frankel, turn our dark cells into monastic cells of prayer peace and meaning making. Die to our ego's desire for power and control and surrender to God's unending mercy and love for every human being. If this is the animating force in our lives, if this is what motivates our actions and agendas, our ends and our means will be the ways of peace. But if there is a discrepancy, when the means do not match the ends, then the spiritual force field is disrupted and confused. If we are activists saying that we are working for peace, but we are angry and self-righteous, then the energy that we put out into the universe will be anything but peaceful. But if our ends and our means are in sync, there will be an integrity and an authenticity that changes the world. Let us go deep into our inner cell where God abides and where we discover irrepressible hope, joy, love, peace, and the truth of our oneness with all God's children. Then we will move out into the world as agents of reconciliation and transformation. This conscious energy will flow through us and help move and direct spiritual evolution in the world. I want to leave you with one final story. Our guide Gabe told us that we just had to go to this Michelin star Israeli restaurant in Berlin called Leila. The chef, Mayor Adani, is a world famous with restaurants in London, New York, all over. Because it was the birthday of the restaurant, Chef Adani came back from Israel to celebrate. I felt compelled to talk to him about the most innovative Epicurean delights I was savoring. So I called him over to the table to the astonishment of my husband. Chef Adani emanated warmth, hospitality, humility, vitality. He asked us about ourselves and Rob, still very emotional from the immersion in our World War II history, began to tear up and said he couldn't sleep last night due to the reckoning with such injustice. Then Chef Adani started tearing up and said, you know, 1.5 million children were murdered. He said a woman in Israel slapped him and said to him, you traitor, how 
dare you open a restaurant in Berlin of all places? And then she pulled up her sleeve to show him the number branded into her arm by the Nazis. He responded to her with compassion, but resolution saying, I must open a restaurant here of all places, the former Gestapo post office to show our triumph our resiliency and creative spirit that they could not kill. Chef Adani assumed Rob and I were Jewish. We said, no, we're human beings, Christians, and you are our brother, and we are all God's children, and we stand in solidarity with you. He said, I believe the same. See those talented young men in the kitchen? This one's Palestinian, this one's Ukrainian, this one's Muslim, this one's Christian. We are one and together we are stronger. Yes, together they made one of the best meals I've ever tasted. For me, it was a peace meal, a foretaste of the feast to come, a tribute to the resiliency and the unity of the human soul. This is what can happen when we know deep inside who and whose we are and don't let the violence and the injury of the world hijack our peace. But we cultivate it through prayer and meditation and then share it with the world. Amen. Thank you for listening on our podcast or through our YouTube playlist of sermons, be sure to forward this message to someone who you believe is seeking God's word today.